same interview with producer engineer Ricky DeLina inside the album Ingve Momstein's trilogy. More info at fullandbloom.com. How do you end up recording Ingve's trilogy? He was doing an interview where musicians interview musicians or something like that. And they were talking about Jeff Beck and I think with how Ingve put it, if I remember correctly, he heard the Jeff Beck record. He liked what it, what it sounded like. And, you know, he reached out to get me to work with him. So I said, yeah, sure. What was the name of that Jeff Beck record? Flash. It started with me doing People Get Ready with Rod and Jeff. You know, we were just out to dinner one night. We were at Dan Tanner's having dinner. I was having dinner with Rod. And um, Jeff walked in the restaurant and I went over and I got Jeff. I brought him to the table and we got to talking. And, you know, I, I guess Rod and Jeff hadn't seen each other in a long time. And and uh, for whatever reason, we wound up back in the studio and with a drum machine and a keyboard bass and Jeff on guitar and Rod singing, we did People Get Ready. It turned into Rod used it, Jeff used it. And then because of that, uh, you know, Jeff was working on a record in New York with, um, uh, I forgot his name. Anyway, I got a call that he was wanted to come to L.A. And he wanted me to finish the record. Me and my brother did it. We did about six songs on it. But people, get, it started with People Get Ready. I, I wound up, believe it or not, putting Jeff and Rod back in a room together. And then Jeff played on Rod's record and Rod sang a song on his record and they did it. They started touring, but then that fell apart. Wow. You're making history. I mean, that's incredible. Same thing with Ronnie Wood. You know, Jeff, you know, I was working with Rod for like two years, and he went on tour. And I started working on Ronnie Wood's solo album uh, with Andy Jones. And when Rod came back, he's like, hey, I need you to come and help me, you know, work on this record. I said, oh, I'm working with Ronnie, your, your soulmate. And he went, oh, okay. And then I wound up taking Rod up to Ronnie's house. And that was interesting because they all of a sudden started, you know, because Rod had a thing of, uh, when he was with a girl or he fell in love with somebody, he'd just like disappear into his own world. So between Jeff Beck and Ronnie Wood, I was kind of in the middle of all that kind of stuff. So that was fun too. Rod got to play with Ronnie. And Ronnie got to play with Rod again. So that was a lot of fun. Any moments and, stand out in your mind when you reflect on that? Oh, yeah. Listen, I was... Um, so working with Ronnie was really interesting because, you know, it was Ringo Starr and Charlie Watts on drums. It was Duck Dunn on bass. It was Keith Richards and Bob Dylan on guitar. You know, it was like all <laughs> these who's who. So <laughs> Ronnie goes, hey, I got to go over to the studio and do a track. So me and my brother and Ronnie jump in the car. We drive over to, I think it was Clover Studios. And we're, me and my brother sitting in the control room and we're looking through the mirror and there's Ringo and there's Bob Dylan and Keith Richards and Ronnie Wood and Duck Dunn. And then we're sitting, me and my brother looking at each other like, can you believe this? This is so crazy. <laughs> so yeah, it was a lot of that stuff with Ronnie Wood and everybody wanted to be around Ronnie all the time. Big personality, great guy. So getting to work with Ronnie... You know, you got to uh, be around really interesting people. Working with Ronnie and Rod together again, because they're, they're like brothers. They're like two of a kind. Rod being the good boy, Ronnie being a little bit of a scallywag, you know. he's a <laughs> He was a little wild back then. And uh, seeing them two, they came up together and they've been brothers for a long time. And right. to see them back together again was just great. And Jeff Beck, too. You know, see Rod and Jeff, you know. It was just me, you know. It was oh, Actually, Carmine was there. Carmine programmed the drum machine. That's right. And Dwayne Hitchings did the keyboard bass, I think. That's right. It was Carmine and Dwayne. I was the engineer, and, and I just got Rod behind the mic, and they ran the song down three times, and I think we kept the first take. So that's like a one-take demo, basically. Just t turned out good. That's fucking surreal. Catching magic, catching lightning in the bottle. You know, that happens once in a while. That's incredible. Why would Carmine be, why wouldn't he just play the drums? They wanted... Because it was a spur of the moment thing. Like, you know, from the restaurant, I called the studio. I said, hey, is a room open? We went down there and Jeff didn't have a guitar. I think he picked up a guitar that Paul Stanley had lying around. And he plugged into an amp that the Stray Cats had lying around. You know, it was just a spur of the moment thing. It wasn't... Like, you know, let's get a session set up. That's, you know, it, it literally just happened. Like I said, it was like, oh, okay. 
Abracadabra, boom, here's the song. Um, okay, so then from that... Okay, so yeah, in- Ingve, I he got a hold of me, and I was really impressed. He was young. He was young at the time. He was just coming up, but he, he was a guitar virtuoso. He was... Had you heard of him before? No. Okay. No, I had not. When I, when I got to call, I started looking up, you know, I started looking at it a little bit, and I was excited to meet him. You know, I, I thought, let's see what this kid's all about. And he, he was like Eddie Van Halen in the sense that these guys picked up a guitar and did things, and you went, okay, wow. And, you know, I, I got to work with some pretty good guitar players over the years, and um, working with Ingve was interesting. It was It was fun. I don't think it's a great sounding record. I, I think it's one of my worst sounding records, unfortunately. But a lot of people like it. I got a lot of calls. I think it's one of his it. better, better records, really. I think uh, a couple of songs on there that I think are good songs for Ingve. Yeah, I mean, he, he, yeah, he, Ingve, he's a talented guy, good guy. I like him a lot, and I haven't seen him in so many years. But uh, I enjoyed working with him. It was easy to work with him. He knew what he wanted. We kept it simple. He had his Marshall stack, and you know, I just, I just mic it simply with either a fifty-seven or a four twenty-one. Sometimes I'd use a room mic like a four fourteen or eighty-seven, just basic stuff. I like to keep it raw because I learned that from uh, Eddie Van Halen because I did a record up at Eddie Van Halen's house with Andy Johns, a band called The Wild Side, and sure. I got to you know see a little bit of how Eddie handled things, and sometimes simple is. Not sometimes, all the time. Simple is better. If some of these guys go in the studio, they put 200 mics on a pair of drums, and I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> you know, I I just try to make, keep it as simple as possible. Glenn Johns, Andy's brother, you know, used three microphones on Who's Next. Listen to that record. We we kept it simple with, with Ingve. You know, he had his drummer and keyboard player over from Stockholm, and you know these guys were. You know, it's interesting, except for Ingve. You know the, those kind of guys reminded me of the Japanese a little bit. They're very good at what they're very good at what they do. They're playing. They're uh, they're really focused and structured. What was lacking, what what lacks in with those with that is you know that soulfulness that very few people have, black people have it naturally, white people try to mimic it, Americans sort of have, have it down, but it's it's hard to have, it's, it's what well, I'm trying to say it correctly, because I don't want to, I'm not trying to say anything bad about anybody. Of I'm course. just saying these guys are mechanically brilliant, and what you want to do is try to slow it down and simplify it a little bit to let some air in and bring some soulfulness into it. So it's less mechanical and more bring a little flavor into it. So I tried to do that, you know, but Ingve Ingve is very headstrong. He knew what he wanted to do. That record came out the way it did. Yeah, I've always felt, and I've said it before, where, you know, often those guys, um, I think I was doing like a White Snake interview and I'm talking about John Sykes and John Sykes leaves and then they get like guitar heroes in there, Steve Vai and I mean often you get these guys and they're like so mind blowing technically, but then they're not really great songwriters often. No, well that's I mean I mean that's the trick with any artist that comes out to the songs. I don't care how good you are or what you do. If you want to have lasting notice in this business, it comes down to songs, really. That's what everybody, though. But technically, talent-wise, they're amazing, amazing guys. Just the songs. You oh, know. my God, yeah. Next level. I mean, Ingve is somebody like who came along, and it probably took five, six years before people caught up, and, and then you started seeing people cop his style. You know, that one was like a long time for people to catch up. There's a lot of kids... That like that. They like that, you know, that they like those kind of guitar players that are super talented, who could play fast. And to them, it's not about the songs. It's about the musicianship. And I understand that. To me, it's always about songs. But when your musicians are at that level, that's also very um, interesting and enticing. And kids eat that stuff up. And Ingve certainly, at that age, when I worked with him, you know, it was just, just a kid. Him play. It was like, holy shit. Oh, I this bet. This kid is amazing. And, you know, he's a good guy, too. So it was fun to work with him. I miss him. I'd love to see him again. Do you guys meet up first at the studio, or is it just the day of the yeah, session? 
I, I was, I knew his manager, um, and they put us together. We met. I can't remember if it was at the studio or the all. I don't remember. I think it was at the studio. And he said, "Hey, look, I got this three album deal, and, and I heard you what you did with Jeff Beck, and you know I want to see if we can do this." I said, "Yeah, sure." And you know, it was it was pretty straightforward. It was like, "Hey, let's just do it and get going. Come on, one, two, three, go." So I, you know, I booked a. We did it at the Village. Um, I booked the Village, and um, and uh, off we went. And so you're working on the Neve board, right? Yeah. Well, the trick was for most guys. Uh, my age and and from my time, I mean, if you can track on an Eve, those old Eves, and even in New York, the old APIs, and then mix on the SSL, that was the magic combination. Of course, tracking on those old Eves, you got that warm sound. You know, you know how to hit the tape right. You got that tape compression with that warm sound. You get off those Eves, and you know it takes a little while to learn how to do do those things, you know, hit the tape right so you don't oversaturate it, but it's a compression that you can't get anywhere else. Um, And yeah, and then you could take it to a Neve and, I mean, an SSL and off you go. And that's what you did? You mixed that album on, where'd you mix it? Oh, let me think. Oh, fuck. But you did, you did mix it on an SSL? I can't remember. I honestly can't remember. Okay. I have to look it up. I have to look it up. Because it was you and Ingbe that... that. I I have years and years of diaries because I used to just write down everything I was doing. Oh, wow. Diaries. Yeah. And I know I have it somewhere. I should have been a little bit more prepared, but I don't normally do these interviews anymore because it's it's hard to remember from 35 years ago. Sure. You know, all I have to do is look at my diary. I could be more specific i don't know if i stayed at the village and mixed it on an eve or or took it to an ssl i can't remember anyway yeah so uh interesting but yeah neve console is the way to go i mean i'm i'm an old-fashioned guy i'm a tape guy i'm a analog guy um uh now digital has been around for so long and that's my dog drinking water. I was back. just going to say, is that a dog? A big black lab. I know that. Oh, man, it had to be a lab. I just, I had a yellow lab he passed in uh, November. Just, I'm still crushed. I'm, yeah, I'm I just, know how you uh, feel. I had a I had a yellow lab, and at, when he was five years old, he ran out in the street, something he never did before, and got hit by a car. Holy that shit. That was devastating. Oh, my God. And my wife went and got a chocolate lab that we had to put to sleep two years ago. I'm still devastated over that. And now we have this almost two-year-old lab who just got an operation, tore his ACL $6,000 later. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. How did he tear it? You know, I got a big property. I got a big yard here. And uh, my son has a dog. He'd come up with his dog and just run around and roughhouse. And somehow there was three dogs here one day, three big dogs, and they're all playing rough and something happened. They tumbled and he wound up tearing his ACL and now he's got a cone on his head, a bunch of stitches on his leg and starting to heal. Yeah. I know how you feel. I'm sorry to hear that. That's a, oh, yeah. that's a terrible feeling. I actually told my wife, don't get another dog, please. Cause I don't, it breaks my heart to, you know, I, I know they don't last long and it, the, the pleasure you get while they're here is amazing. Cause they love you so much. But, you know, you got to go through that. You know, it's too soon. Oh, I know it. It's just, it's... Anyway, a, yeah. back to Yngwie. Honestly, they were, they were fun to work with. Mechanically and um, uh, musician-wise, they were just amazing, all of them. Yngwie, you know, uh, it's very special. You know, Yngwie was like the Tiger Woods or the Derek Jeter of musicians. He was oh, just no great. Doubt. He was just great. He was a, he's a natural, he, he can play as fast and as, as, as any of those kind of players can play. And I know that's attractive. If, if he, if he had the songwriting chops or, you know, if he had a team around him that found him the right songs, he would be a mega, mega star is bigger than, you know, just a guitar hero stuff. And do you guys do pre-production for that album? 
No, a, a little bit. Not, you know, normally you would spend about a month working with somebody, you know, in rehearsals and things like that. But this was, this came together fast. And I think it was because he, I think he just knew what he wanted. And I don't think the, the this, you know, he wasn't looking for a pop's hit on the charts. He wasn't, he was looking to make a, a let me blow you away with our musicianship type of record. And that's what he was doing. So it came together really fast. But normally you would spend, you know, if you're going to produce a record or take a band on like that, you would spend time with them. But most of the records we were doing back then, you know, these were just artists booking the record plant and booking you as an engineer and coming in. And back then it was great. You know, I was, I was in one room working with Rod Stewart. My brother Eddie was in the next one working with Queen and Eddie Money and Kiss and Motley Crue. And, you know, everybody was just there working. It was just one of those places where it was just one after another. And, you know, these big artists would come in one after another. And the record plan had the most talented guys and best rooms. And we were very fortunate to be around in that period. It's about seven, 1975 to 1990 was... Um, a good time, a good time to be in the studio, a good time to be working with all the Brits came over and all the Americans, all the New Yorkers, everybody who came out to L.A. So Ingbe kind of just did pre-production on his own to where when you guys enter the studio, he had everything down at that point? Yeah, I mean, he worked with his band and he, they worked out what they wanted to do. But technically, yeah, he, he got what he wanted. But, you know, once again, I... I'm sure his fan base were very happy with what he was doing. I just came from a different place. I worked with artists who their thing was songs, you know, developing songs, putting singles out and things like that. But that was because it was the bigger bands and the bands that have been around for a while. You know, guys like Ingve just coming up, you know, he was a little young, a little raw and and that's what he wanted, and that's what we just did. We just banged it out. And he's kind of acting as the producer on that album, right? Yeah, we co produced I don't know. I forgot what the credits looked like, but we co produced it and I engineered it. But yeah, I, I, I never was much for demanding credits or anything like that. Um, that wasn't important to me. <laughs> Four points on a record. You weren't concerned about that kind of stuff? Well, I got to take, I, I, I was paid well for that record i i the deal i made was a money deal and I, I was fine with that normally you as a producer you would go three or four points things like that but i didn't get into producing till later on and you know i was just sort of the i was co-producing with the bands like with kevin dubro and white riot and, and so many other things i was doing because i've been around long enough and worked with enough people that they trusted i could put a record together and that's how it kind of worked out ingbe was hip to the idea that a lot of it is coming from the engineer yeah when you're in the studio and you're in the studio for two three four months with an artist you got to be on the same page you got to be thinking it's a little bit of a team effort Regardless of who's producing, or, or it's the producer or engineer and the artists have to be all one, really, because engineers come up with different things. I've worked with producers that didn't do anything but try to figure out how to keep a band in time. Or like I remember when we were doing Foolish Behavior, that the record with Rod, with Tom Dowd, he was a big record producer. He was there. I don't, I don't even know what he was doing because Rod was doing his own thing anyway. And I was looking to us in the control room and taking lead from us. So Tom wound up leaving halfway through that record. But that's kind of how it goes, you know, the engineer. Like a, like in a, in a film, the producer and director, it's like in the studio, producer, engineer. In a film, the director takes the lead, right? He's working with the with the talent he's it's his vision it's the same thing in the studio with an engineer it's really you're shaping you're trying to create what the artist has in their head and what they want to accomplish and the producers there some some producers are real good record guys like george martin was an amazing record guy you know to put a record together the beatles were young raw kids and george martin created that thing for them phil ramone good record guy with Billy Joel and all the things he's done. You know, these there's certain guys that are really good at understanding how to put a record together and a single together. Um, Jimmy Iveen was, was good at that. Terrible engineer, but great record. He understood 
you understood what a hit record was. And getting Stevie Nicks and Tom Petty and pulling them out of what they were doing and, and coming up with some good music. So, but other producers are not record guys. They're more, um, let's figure out how to just put this together and give with the record company what they want and leave all the imagination up to the musicians and the engineer, right? So two kinds of producers. And but I loved being an engineer. That's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to be a musician. I didn't want to be in a band. I just liked working with different bands and, you know, I had a good run. I was just more fortunate than anything. I was more fortunate than talented. I didn't know what I was doing. I still don't know what I'm doing. How does somebody like Ingve compare? Like, how, would you say, um, does he have any strengths as a producer? Is he different in his approach? Well, in, that, well this, this was when he was a kid. But Ingve's talent was, he was an amazing musician. He really put his heart and soul into what he was doing. He knew what he wanted to do. So in that sense, yeah, he he understood at a young age what he wanted to de- be developed at, for him as an artist. So yeah, I wouldn't call him a producer, but I'd call him somebody who, who had a vision of what he wanted to do and he was trying to accomplish it. Now, like I said, a, a, if, if that record had pre-production time and a big enough production producer name to, to go out and find a couple of songs to just put on there to get the kind of radio play you need to get to push records like that, that record would have been twice as big. But just because it's Ingve and his guitar playing and his and his skill set and what he did, it appealed to a big enough audience for him that worked for him. So yeah, I mean, it's that that question. You know, I don't I don't know what he became later on in life, but yeah, he was young back then. Of course, but yeah, young but focused, laser focused, very talented. And so, is it just like the two of you yeah, recording two, everything? We were we were making all the decisions and doing everything. It was just the two of us. Okay, nobody else. Nobody else had a say in any of it. And is it kind and of a back and forth thing? thing? Like, what do you think of that take? What do you think of that vocal take? What do you think? Well, of I actually bumped heads with him a lot. We'd argue about a couple of things because, you know, he he's headstrong. I was a little headstrong, and we'd bump heads a little bit, but. It was his record, so I got it after a while. As far as what do you mean you got it after a while? You would just be like whatever. You know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta work with people. Everybody has different personalities, different feeling about things, and you could either constantly rub with it or you just figure it out. And I've worked on enough records by then that I understood how to get something on tape that was had value enough to keep it and move on and where Ingve was still new and raw so some of his decisions I you know was wasn't in agreement with and I'm sure he wasn't in agreement with some of my decisions but after a while you just say all right I get it and just figure out how to move forward you don't want to work with people that are not on the same page. And so just what, after a while, you would just be like, I'm not going to even argue that? Right, yeah, it's not worth Are there any that. particular things that you kind of uh, were like, oh? No, not, not really. There was no drama or anything like that. You know, I like to slow things down a little bit and let's, you know, let's look at this and is there a better way of getting through this song or what can we do? Like there was a band I produced called Racer X. Sure. You know that band? Of course. Okay, great musicians also. And, um, you know, we were doing that record. It was a live, I think it was Race X Live or something. It was like a double live record. And I remember there was one song where there was just no air in it. It was just wall-to-wall guitar, you know. And there was one point where there was a little pocket of air. And I think it was Paul Gilbert. And he said, oh, yeah, let's, let's fill that in. And I'm like, no, let it, let it breathe for a second. I mean, there's, you know, some of those guys were like just all in everything, you know. And you, as somebody who's been around for a while, understood that, you know, sometimes just let it breathe for a second, like a bottle of wine. Open it up, let it breathe, give it some air. And just doesn't have to be wall to wall, you know fastest guitar playing on the planet type right. stuff. You know, that's that was their style. And that's why I didn't do rap records because <laughs> I, would, I would have been in the room going, what? 
what, what are you doing? You know, when you're used to working with musicians that have been around and made amazing records and there's a certain attitude in the, in the studio where only the best guys are in the room. If you're in the room with, the, with Queen or Rod or, or the Rolling Stones or Bruce, or any one of those guys, that means there's a reason that you're in that room. You know, no slackers around those kind of sessions. Now, everybody has an ability that's respected and and that's why you're in that room. And sometimes when you work with those artists that on that professional level, it just, there's an understanding. And I think everybody's always on the same plane. With some of the new artists who haven't been out there, and, and it's not no fault of their own, it's just that the younger and they don't have that experience yet. <laughs> It's a little challenging working with that because it's almost like they don't respect. Maybe they res, they listen to what you have to say and they go, okay, yeah, yeah, I respect what you're saying, but yes, I'm going to do this anyway. I'm like, oh, okay, what are you supposed to do? You just fight every little note? No, thank you. I don't have the patience for that. I got my way sometimes, and he got his way most of the time. <laughs> and that's what it's like with any new anybody at new at things. You know, every five years you look back and you go, oh, wow, look at that. You know, you, you just grow as a human being, when you're, especially when you're exposed to such amazing, talented people. And that stuff just creeps into your soul and you get to share those experiences with the next group. And some people understand it and some people don't. Ingvay was very headstrong. His personality was very headstrong. So hard to get through to people like that sometimes. But that's okay. He's a talented guy. He's fine. You know, oh, he's coming. Yeah, he's kind of on a. Uh, really, that's pretty early in the career. He'd had a couple of albums, and then it's just kind of all took off pretty fast for him once he got over here. And then being yeah. that uh, great on guitar, you know, I think it adds something. Yeah, his musicianship carried him through. So right. that was. Yeah. And are you recording the drums first, kind of standard? You do the drums first on that record? Well, it's, you know, it's, depending on the band, like if you're working with like a band like the Rolling Stones, everybody's playing at once and they'll just keep on playing until the vibe is right. And then, you, you know, those guys are all about feel. It doesn't matter. They'll sit in a room and play with each other. Some other bands, like Ingve, for example, you want to get maybe the drums, bass, and a rhythm guitar track down and then just overdub everything around it. Sometimes just the drums and the bass, just to make sure you, you're locking in that rhythm section that's going to, you know, hold that song together. So a lot of what was going on in those days were just set the drums up in the middle of the room, put up some room mics, you know, you, you get a good drum sound, you stick a bass in some bass cabinet somewhere or vocal booth, you set that up so there's no bleed and the bass player is playing in the control room while the drum is out there because it's easier to hear in the control room, maybe a rhythm guitar track. And then from there you start building a song. And then the older way, the old Brits, the Brits love to work together as a unit, you know, working with Rod and those guys at three guitar plays, bass player, keyboard, drums, Rod singing, you know, is everybody in the room and you just, you going through the song and, until it feels right. And then there you go. Some of these younger guys, man, it's just you just want to, you just at least want to get a good solid backbeat down, so you could start to build around it. Of course, but on the Ingve record, you're cutting the drums first. Yeah, drums, okay. bass, maybe rhythm guitar. And of course, Ingve plays bass and guitar on that album, right? Yeah, he's plays. <laughs> yeah, there was a bass player, but yeah, he also plays bass. I think he played bass on most of it. That's, I forgot about that. You probably know more than I do. Huh? As far as credited, it says he played bass on that album. Yeah, so you know, and that, and I don't, I didn't like that, by the way. I, I remember now, I, because you know, a bass player just brings a different feel and a little bit of a different touch to it. But once again, Ingve was more interested in the mechanics than he was in, in, I guess the, the soul of the song. It's hard for me to say. Yeah. But, you know, when you're talented like that, you know, you could, you know, like a guy like Ronnie Wood. Ronnie Wood plays everything. You just, you pick up a saxophone, you pick on the drums and play bass, play guitar. You know, he's one of those guys that could do it all. Like Paul McCartney, same thing. You know, just guys 
just play. And then you got guys at the level of Ingray where not only do they play, but they play everything, you know, like they were savants. So right. But sometimes it takes a little bit. That's that's another thing that I think takes a little bit of the soul out of them. But when he's cutting the drums, is it just like Ingve and the drummer Anders jamming? Anders, wow, you are back in memory. Yeah, something like that. Maybe keyboard too, keyboard drum space. You know, we just did whatever felt right. And honestly, I I couldn't go track by track with you because I just just thirty five years ago and I did you know hundred records. Of course, but you know, um, like bleeds in one, bleeds into the other. Of course, but as far as uh, when you're laying down his guitars, I know you said you keep it simple. So you're putting more like a fifty seven, or uh, you said a four fourteen. You know, I try different mics, but I, I like to keep that simple because I find you know I I went through the gamut with with like you know finding a putting a 47 tube or, you know, finding all, all these old tube mics and this and that. And sometimes, man, you just shove a 57 up to the cabinet, you find a sweet spot and you're going to get a it. great sound. Right. With Inge, I used three mics. I used a 421, a 451, and a 57. Oh, wow. And I, we, we found, you know, each, each cone on the four cones on the Marshall has a different, little bit different sound. And, you know, I would, I would put headsets on, uh, just turn up the amp so it's hissing. You put headsets on and you have a live mic and you go around the cone with the mic, like a 57. Just take a 57 and go around the cone. And you can actually hear a sweet spot in the cone as you circle the cone, 57, with just a hiss coming through. And that's where you, I, I would jam in the, you know, that's where I would put the mic. So you get a 57 and a 421 on two of them, and then the 451, which is Sennheiser 451, and maybe a room mic sometimes, depending on the song, depending on what you want. A little bit more room, a little bit more meat and potatoes. And, but like I said, try to keep it basic. Sometimes you use one mic, sometimes you use three. Pick up the phase and see what works. Move things around, see what works. And you would have the 451 even up close? No, that those Sennheisers are a little bit more delicate than you know. With a fifty-seven, you can hammer a nail into the wall and then of use course. it. Say, you know, it's just a cheap old basic mic. But sometimes for those you know blaring Marshall amps, that stuff they work. Put them, use them on snare drum, use it on the guitar. Some of you know, it, everybody for a little while was starting to get real fancy with mics and trying to use all these old Sennheiser tubes and which is fine, you know, for vocals and other things. And, and we did all that. You know, Record Plan had a great selection of mics. a and had a great selection of mics. But really, for rock and roll, man, just keep it simple and basic and you'll be fine. You don't have to get too crazy because you can also do things later on in the mix. You want to keep it basic so you have more control later. And you don't want to be locked into things because sometimes what sounds good on its own may not sound good in a song with all the other instruments. So sometimes you don't want to get locked into something. Try to keep it as basic as possible. If you need to fatten it up later or thin it out or make a little bit of a change to sort of frequencies fit between a bass drum and a bass guitar and a vocal, you know, later on you have more control over how you want to do it. But make it sound good. And you know right away, you know, you pick up a Strat, you plug in a Marshall, and you hit a chord, and you hear that meaty, nice sound. It, what it sounds like in the room should be what it sounds like coming through the speakers in the control room. So, And that's how I learned, you know, that's how most of us learned in New York. You know, we do a string session. You have 70 string players out there. That's a scary session for a kid. Very expensive to have old-fashioned string players before string keyboards. And you had to get that shit right, right away, because those guys are going to work for four hours and then go home, and that's a big uh, price tag. So I was taught, you know, you go out in the room, let everybody play, and just listen. And just listen to what the instruments sound like and try to get that sound in the control room, correct mic placements. And so that's what I always did. Try to keep it as simple. You know, if, if it was power chords, I knew what to do. If it was just a rhythm track, you know what to do, but make sure that you've got room to m manipulate it later as it filled, as the song fills in. 
Sometimes when it's just bass guitar, drums, and a guitar, you can make it as big as possible. And then you got to put a vocal in, some backing vocals, a keyboard, maybe another guitar, maybe acoustic. And so all that stuff has to all fit in. And as those instruments become part of the song, the other things start to shrink a little bit. So it changes. So that's what I did with Ingve a little bit, is make sure that our basic tracks were raw, punchy, but simple enough that we could fit it in later on. But, you know, Yngwie, and I get a mix up that I liked and then Ingve would sit at the console and take it a little bit different direction. And I would go, OK, I'm not going to fight with you. And then as far as uh, solos, are you comping the solos or are they like one take? If you're lucky, it's one take. Uh, sometimes you're there for three days. Sometimes you're there until four in the morning and it's time to go home. And Ingve's like, oh, one more take. Ingve was um, never wanted to go home. <laughs> he could have gone forever. And, you know, you just get tired. Your ears get tired. And so with, with solos, you know, sometimes you just do, you keep on doing until it feels right. Sometimes you have to build a solo by three different tracks. You take eight bars here, four bars there, go back to the first track, take another four bars, go back to the third track. Sometimes you put it together because for the most part, Ingve's solos were really similar so it was easy to put them together where somebody else might, every solo is different. Eddie Van Halen was like that too. All Eddie Van Halen solos are, are built. They're not one takers, they're built. With Mark Bowles, you have him come in at the end to do the vocals? Yeah, reminded me of that as well. Fuck, I forgot so much. What was your process for recording him? Were you just comping vocals? Yeah, everybody was doing that. Do two, three takes, get comfortable with the song. You record it, you put everything on tape because you never know when magic is going to happen. So I ran tape all the time, no matter what. They were rehearsing a part, if they were just fucking around, if they were, if we were doing something. I just say roll tape because sometimes somebody will do a riff or sing a line or whatever, and you go, oh, okay. And then, you know, at least you have it on tape to either keep it, use it somehow, or try to reproduce it. Or with singers, it was just easy enough because you have 24 tracks, 48 tracks when you tie two machines together. Now you have 3,000 tracks, which is kind of funny. Back then, if you tie two machines together, 48 tracks, a lot of tracks. So, you know, sing the song three, four times, get comfortable with it. Sing through it, mistakes and all. I, I hated when people would stop the tape and go, all right, get, pick it up from there. Sing through it, mistakes and all. Sing it again, mistake, you know, just get through the song, just sing it. And you sit back and you listen and you go, yeah, that, that, that verse is fucking great. Like I told you, people get ready. We wound up with the first take. Rod was, we had 10 bottles of wine at dinner. And we went back to the studio and he sang People Get Ready and three times and we kept the first take. Sometimes works out that way. Other times, you know, you got, you're got you working with 10 vocal tracks and you're trying to create a, you know, one track. I would do three takes. I would sit and listen and I would build from there. And then I, I would think, hey, let's do a couple of more. I, I would like to see if we can get this better or that better. Otherwise, you go nuts because you beat all the fucking day. And then all of a sudden you're putting a vocal track together out of 10 tracks and and all of a sudden you know you you can't hear it's not it's not flowing properly it's there's different breaths at different times it's it's a little weird but a lot of people do that and i i hear it right away like right now because i've been doing film for so long if i hear bad adr like you know when the actor goes in the studio and redoes lines i can hear it right away because i'm so in tune to it from coming from the music business I hated that. And I hated doing those solos with Punky and Angel because Punky would do 10 takes and we'd try to build a solo. Literally, we would, we would, build, we would build words. You know, we'd take the first syllable from this word and, and, this, and then the second syllable from that same word on another take. It was crazy. On Angel? <laughs> on a lot of records, believe me. Really? I just even posted an interview with Tony Platt, who did the ACDC records, you know, back in black with uh, Mutt Lang. And of course, yeah, of course, Mutt Lang's very much, I, I'd never even heard that until that point, or it didn't even dawn on me to change a syllable. Like, <laughs> I was like... I'm not kidding. I punch in syllables with Angel. That's incredible, man. I did it, and I did a record with Eddie Leonetti. And Ed Thacker, a band called 1999, that Jack Douglas was also involved in. I, you know, I'm punching in syllables. And I'm like, come on, guys, this is, we're getting a little bit too, well, let's try to recreate a wheel here. Let's try to perfect what a wheel already does. It's just go and sing the fucking thing. Coming up, sometimes you work with people that 
literally couldn't get through a verse and keep on stopping. All right, you're out of tune. Go and do that line. And I'm like sitting there going, just let the fucking person sing the song and let him get through it a couple of times, get comfortable with it. But with Mark, he's got almost a Ronnie James Dio level voice. So I'm assuming yeah. he's pretty good to work with, right? Yes, he was good and easy to work with. Some people are like that. So yeah. are you doing more with somebody like him on that record? Are you doing more of a, hey, let's just fix a few lines and punch you in? Or are you doing a yeah, comp? That, with him, it was like that. It wasn't like having to do 100 tracks and build anything. He's got that kind of voice that could... You can carry a tune and maybe he needs a repair here and there or a different verse here and there, but pretty straightforward with him. Don't 